All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jonathan Long. I am the Director of Community Advancement for the Wichita Regional Chamber of Commerce, where I oversee our talent, quality of place, leadership, and diversity, equity, and inclusion work. And I wanna uh, welcome you all to our second installment of our By Design series um, that that we just that we're doing to help uh, diverse business owners uh, gain the tools and knowledge to be better uh, to be better equipped to grow and scale their business. So I want to appreciate I appreciate all of you all for registering and joining us tonight. We have an exciting program with uh, some of the top talent when it comes to branding and marketing uh, in the city. We're excited to have everyone join us today. So real quick, I'm going to share my screen here. So before we before we uh, jump into our uh, outstanding presentation, I want to make sure that I thank our sponsors, uh, Evergy, Spirit Aero Systems, Coke, Cargill and Cox, uh, they are they are uh, big supporters of the chamber's work in diversity and inclusion. And as you all know, this type these types of opportunities don't exist without sponsorship. So I want to thank them uh, for sponsoring uh, our diversity, equity, and inclusion work here at the chamber. So next, I'm going to jump right into it because we are extremely lucky to have her. And that's uh, Miss Tammy Bradley. So I'm going to introduce Tammy real quick. And then after that, uh, Tammy will be all yours. Tammy Bradley is the managing partner at Bachner and Bradley, um, where she loves the challenge of communication. And for many of us, we know that communication can be uh, a difficult subject to tackle. And so, uh, and more specifically, she loves to help clients figure out strategies that will help them communicate effectively. With a background in audience research and applied marketing techniques that show success, Tammy, is, Tammy takes this challenge seriously. She spent nearly 12 years in senior management for the Kansas Health Foundation, where she directed social marketing projects related to children's health and public health including Emmy award-winning media campaigns. Not just media campaigns, but Emmy award-winning media campaigns. So if you all haven't, haven't picked up your pen and got some paper, you go need it. She got an Emmy out here, y'all. She out here winning, she out here doing it. Uh, oh my. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she's also, pub she's, she is published in the areas of social marketing, information and information knowledge management. Since starting her own business, Tammy has helped clients understand their own organizational communication needs, their external target audiences, and how to, commun and how to apply communication strategies that make a positive difference. Tammy's a shocker, earning both of her degrees uh, at Wichita State, a bachelor's degree in journalism, and a, mark and a master's degree in communication. Tammy, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We look forward to your presentation. And without further ado, Ms. Tammy Bradley. Thank you, Jonathan. I'm gonna ask you to do all my introductions because I, that is special. I, I don't know where you come up with that, but uh, you laid it on pretty thick there. And I'll try to live up to the expectation a little bit, at least this evening. Uh, the Emmy was a long time ago, but uh, it was a lot of fun. It was for a campaign called Let's Take It Outside. Uh, that the Kansas Health Foundation did. And, and back then, it, it was a great team uh, who um, worked on that. And tonight, some of the ideas I'm going to share with you uh, reflects the 17 years that my business partner, Vera Bothner, and I have been doing this kind of work with a bunch of different clients. Um, and also on this call, teammates I'm, I might lean on, Monica, Angie, Nicole, Christina, you all do this work day in and day out too, so please feel free to jump in. Um, I'm gonna have to jump off the call about 6.40 to do another call a little later, and so I apologize for that, but I'll get started. Um, I think I need to share my screen, don't I? All right, 
So um, Jonathan asked if I would talk about storytelling as part of brand management. Um, so that's what I'm going to take. It's a little piece of brand management, but I think it's a really foundational piece when we start with storytelling. So I'm going to go through a few slides. Can you see that, Jonathan? Okay. The um, quote that I use here, and I use this a lot, is that stories matter and many stories matter from a novelist um, who writes a lot about the importance of writing from different perspectives. But what I like about this quote is that you can't just tell one story. You have to tell many stories when you're starting your brand or talking about your brand. And so that's what I'm going to time to dive into a little bit here is the idea that um, there are certain rules we can apply to telling our stories. And if we get the stories right, then the application, whether that's through social media, traditional media, emails, all of that um, become a little easier when we have the story that we're telling right. So tell a true story well. And then my favorite quote from one of my favorite authors is Anne Lamott, which is about as easy and pleasurable as bathing a cat. So let's not take this idea that telling our story is so easy that anybody can do it. It does take some pretty careful planning. And if, if you're a part of a one person shop, it's even more challenging to try to get that um, both objective and subjective viewpoint and bring all the elements together. So I hope I can talk through some of that and make it real for all of us. Brand story characteristics. Um, I do, I, I have to admit, I'm, I'm a former journalist. I don't tell that to everybody, but um, I feel like this is a safe group tonight. Um, but the elements of your story, uh, your brand, is not that much different than, um, than what journalists do in terms of telling your story. And in fact, I'm gonna use a term that I've just run across recently called brand journalism as I work through this. But your story, you have to make sure it's true. It's true to who you are as a brand. It's true to the, the type of business you're, you're operating and your, what your customers expect from you. It's human. It's original. Always focuses on whoever your customer is. You could tell the story from your perspective, but, but unless it resonates to who you're trying to sell to or um, serve, it really doesn't matter. They have to be the one it makes uh, sense to. And that's where it gets a little complicated, is putting yourself in the shoes of your customer. And then it has to tell a, a bigger story that's aligned with your business strategies. So I hope you all have a solid business plan. If you're part of Create Campaign, I bet you do. Um, the idea that you know what your uh, short-term and long-term strategies are and how to get there Make sure your storytelling, your brand management aligns with that. Okay. This is an example that came across, uh, actually I give full credit to the Wichita Eagle for bringing this to my attention. A uh, company called Panole Blue, are you all familiar? Some of you are familiar with that. Great small business story. Um, they make tortillas out of a, um, gray or a, a corn that is from Mexico. The owner, uh, the owners are two young entrepreneurs. Uh, one of them is named, I'm gonna get it wrong here. I thought I had it written down. Sorry, you're gonna have to follow them on TikTok. That's all there is to it. They have done a great job of telling their story in short bursts of energetic segments uh, and they've made it fun. They've made it look delicious. Um, and as a result, during this COVID time, they've really boosted their sales, their awareness uh, of their business through these little short storytelling um, segments that are really, really fun to watch. And I'm not, I'm personally not on TikTok that, at all, but I went there specifically to read their and hear about their story because they did such a great job with it. Um, the quote from one of the owners, I feel like TikTok is a really great platform to get in front of the right people and be able to get discovered by niche audiences. And again, I think they, they kind of tapped into this idea of they knew what their story was. They knew they had a great history um, 
of their, their families coming from Mexico. The, the corn means a lot to where uh, they grew up. And now they're applying it to whole different types of, not just tortillas anymore. It's a lot of different recipes that they're applying their, their talents to. So this just goes to, like I said, uh, knowing who you are, knowing the type of story you want to tell, and then finding the right, right plat platform in which to do that. And what I think is neat about this, and I'm, I'll bring it up again here uh, in a few minutes, um, is this idea of knowing what your personal brand is and then uh, applying it to your business. And anymore, we don't have the pleasure of having a personal brand being separate from our business brand. We've seen some local businesses here lately just get kind of um, crucified in social media because they've, they've crossed those lines. So um, whatever you do, just be mindful of that. If you wanna take a stand, I think that's fine. Just re know it reflects on you and your business when you do so. Um, here's the deal. When you're trying to tell your own story, these are some questions that help you position the story you want told. Now, not very many of us, especially like I said, if you're a one person shop or two person shop gets to stand back and say, I'd like this person to interview me and then we'll write a story about this. So find somebody in your life if you don't have a team of communications people, um, uh, do the best you can. Go to someone and say, hey, sit down with me and ask me some of these questions. Let me figure out the best way I can tell my story. What's unique about what I do? If you've been doing this for a while, I mean, just a couple of years ago, uh, Vera and I sat down and started asking ourselves, why are we doing this? What's our story of why? And so we were able to come up with the audience research, the strategic planning and strategic communications, the three pillars of what we do um, through that process. So sometimes it's just a good way to re-energize your business. But if you're just starting out to kind of give yourself that opportunity to say, well, here's the story I want to uh, tell about how um, we feel about our customers and what makes them so special and why they should be engaged with us. You aren't going to be able to tell your stories hitting all of these. So pick out one or two you think resonates with how you want to tell your story and then kind of focus in on it. And, uh, and if we had more time, I love to do little workshops where people actually sit down and start writing out their messages and what their stories would be. Um, because it's really fun to see the different, um, uh, the different perspectives that come up in those kind of storytelling uh, opportunities. Uh, here are some just general rules. Um, don't use buzzwords. Uh, be able to simply and concisely tell what sets your, you or your company apart from your competitors. And this is really important. Tell me why, if I'm your customer, tell me why you matter to me. Because if you are able to do that, you're going to engage me for further conversation. And that's the beginning of um, building awareness and, um, and turning leads into um, conversions to sales. Again, part of the storytelling, part of who you are, who your brand is, is where, what is your voice? And I'm gonna apologize, my dog is barking in the background and I hope it's not coming through too, too much in the presentation here. But what is your voice? Um, you want to be professional, but you can also be casual. You can be informal or you can be formal. It all depends on what the brand is that you're trying to convey, the story you're trying to convey. I'm using the Bombas uh, uh, sock company here as an example because I think they've done a really good job of setting themselves apart from competitors in a storytelling kind of way. They have a philanthropic side of their business that I think is really cool. Um, and they, you know, donate a pair of socks for everyone they sell. So just being able to tell that story, um, they, they are very consistent. You see it in their social media messages. You see it on their website. Uh, I'm a customer, so I get their emails. Um, so you just see it over and over and over, layered and layered and layered. And that is what good marketing, good brand management is. 
Um, in terms of voice, tone is a large part of this. And like I said, mostly for companies like this, uh, depending on what your service is, what your, your product is, sometimes you can have a very fun tone, a very um, casual tone. But if something's going on in your company and you need to pivot and be serious, recognize that because uh, we've seen how people can um, not read the room, not be aware of what's going on in the, in the community or the country right now, and really stumble on that. So tone is a large part of being able to continue that conversation with the community. Um, writing your own story. Um, I'm gonna, like I said, talk a little bit about sort of the guidelines here. Brand journalism, I, I like that idea. Um, I hadn't really thought about it in that term until recently, but this is working inside a company or an organization, writing and producing content, um, much like a journalist would. So you start out with who, what, where, when, why, how. If you're writing a press release or you're writing a, a letter or an email or doing a direct mail, um, it really just gets you kind of to organize your thoughts in a, in a way. Um, and like I said, it's easy if you have a team that can help you do this, but it's a one or two person shop like we are, we're writing our content, we're producing it, we're helping clients do the same. Um, and so kind of stepping back and saying, how can I be objective about this, uh, much like a journalist it is really important. You can generate brand awareness this way. Um, depending on what your business is, um, there's a way to produce and utilize industry news that's already out there and then apply it to your business. Um, and, um, and then there's a, a way to position yourself as a thought leader, uh, writing guest editorials or um, engaging Benita at the community voice uh, with some of her news and what she's doing. Um, and speaking of Bonita, I just have to say from a brand management storytelling approach, she has done an exceptional job. I've known Bonita for years and her story and her product has not changed. It's consistent. She's built trust she uh, delivers and I, I just have to give her a lot of um, kudos for doing this for I don't know how many years now. I don't want to age her or myself. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there. Um, but, but by doing that over time and building trust, um, you're building a brand that people uh, will see you as a leader and will want to engage and do business with you. Um, another person who comes to mind when I think about this stuff is um, Jacob Wayman. I don't know if many of you know Jacob. He, he's gone through a lot of changes the last year or two with his own uh, uh, businesses and he, he runs a couple of Orange Theory fitness um, places now, but COVID hit him right at the heart of when he was trying to open. And I have to give him so much credit. He has he has used his own personal brand to turn it into a, a holistic fitness uh, attitude, engaging with his customers or likely customers, um, using his own positive spin on um, telling his story and, and then that layers into his journey in opening Orange Theory and keeping it open during this time. So if you don't follow him on Twitter, um, I would suggest you do. It's just, he's just a good young entrepreneur who stays really positive in the face of a lot of uh, changes that we're all going through right now. So back to some of these storytelling guidelines. Um, as I said before, tell the truth. Always show, if you can show, don't tell you know, your stories to your customers. That's what I love about the Pinole Blue guys. They found a way to show their story visually, um, and with great energy. Uh, see content mo moments everywhere. Like I said before, this is another new term for me is newsjacking. Be careful not to steal content, um, but finding a way to um, use what's going on in the nation or, or locally uh, in the community to tell your story is a great way to do it too. 
uh, post news that really is news. Maybe it's about you, maybe it's not, um, but make sure it fits into your story and um, is consistent with the, the kind of story you want to put out. And this idea that you can be biased and balanced. Um, you can only tell people so many times uh, that you're great um, in your storytelling. You got to show uh, how what you're doing fits into the bigger world. Um, if you get the opportunity to be interviewed, um, these are some just great uh, perspectives to think about. Or if you are in a position where you're able to think, these are the six messages I want to get out in the next year about what I'm, what we're all about. Know your audience and be an advocate for them. I go back to Orange Theory. I mean. Jacob was so concerned about the people who um, were fanatical about going to his um, fitness place. He really wanted to stay engaged with them um, throughout this whole process. And he became such a good advocate for when they were staying at home, how they could work out. Um, just, he was just wonderful about that. Um, don't worry about not knowing. If you have a story you want to tell, but you aren't ready, figure it out and, um, and, and get back to it. Do your research. Um, I'm gonna have a couple of resources here on one of these next slides. Um, be in on one-on-one -on -one conversations. I, I hate to say this about my, my PR. I mean, that's who I am and that's what I do, but sometimes we can get it wrong uh, or sometimes we can get into a thing that, I like this next bullet point about getting the spiel out we do a lot of training with uh, business owners and um, particularly for working with media, but they get so trained to have a spiel. You probably have a spiel, get it out of the way and then start talking real talk. So you know your customers are going to listen to it. Um, I like this idea of where I don't do podcasts, but I like to listen to them occasionally. If that's part of what your marketing package is, I love the conversational aspect of podcasts. It's not a real interview. It's you're sharing information back and forth and building and layering. Um, again, knowing your story makes those kind of opportunities really important to be able to take advantage of. Um, some of the superlatives can make good conversations. Um, you know, what was your, your most uh, controversial uh, start to your business? What, was, what did you have to overcome? What's been the greatest or the baddest experience you've had? And then be able to just shut up and let other people talk about your product, tell your story. Um, you don't have to be out there in front of everybody all the time. In fact, it's better if you can kind of put yourself aside and let other people tell your story. Now they're gonna have to hear it a few times before they are able to tell it as good as you are, but that's, that's kind of, um, that approach. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these. My favorite, I have two favorites on here. In terms of storytelling, I just think this is such a, a visual um, way to think about creating content. Is your mind like water? The, the, the crevices are where we, st we st our stories flow in and out of. And so if you can find a way to get out of your business um, environment, kind of go to a place that is new and different. I know we do a lot of work in coffee shops and things like that, but just being outdoors and sort of letting your mind relax and finding those stories that maybe wouldn't come to you in another way. But that's where a lot of the, the um, storytelling process, the really good stories lie, I think, are in those areas. And I was always told from my reporter days when I was very young that there are no bad stories, they're only bad writers. And I think that's still true to this day. Everybody has a great story to be told. It's just finding a way to tell it. The other part of this is don't be an asshat. I said this earlier. Um, don't steal other content. Um, if you're gonna use other people's content and share it, just give them the credit for it. Um, and don't, don't use wonderful artwork and then slap your name on it, things like that. That's not your story, so. Uh, the ground, your content and data. These are three sources that actually I just, in doing some research for another project, came across. Um, but they're fabulous resources. Google Trends, Google Ngram Viewer, um, and Think with Google. These are all data sources or opportunities to, 
I struggle a lot with like, um, not even necessarily inf infographics, but visually telling a story. And these are, these are places where a lot of data is stored. And so they have some really cool ideas about how you can present data in ways that are um, easy to digest, I guess. So I think that's all I had in terms of uh, presentation. Like I said, I kind of went really deep into storytelling as part of your brand management, um, but I'm really welcome uh, questions and conversation to understand what you all are looking for when it comes to brand management, storytelling. Thank you so much, Tammy. I, uh... I have a I have a question. Sure. What what advice would you offer to business owners who are looking to manage a negative or critical perceptions of their brand or maybe even a negative review on social media? It's a great question, Jonathan, and I wish there was a straightforward answer. I think all my colleagues on this call could could address this in one way or the other. Um, the best advice I ever heard was to try to take the conversation offline, if you can, and not have a debate in front of the public. Now, if you're trying to set the record straight, um, try to do that so that you fix any um, misperceptions that could be generated by this. But if it gener if it um, there's so much um, uh, vitriol on social media right now. It's just hard to have those conversations in a way that really benefit you and your brand. Um, like I said, I've seen a couple of things here locally lately that I think maybe, you know, hindsight's 2020, maybe things shouldn't have been posted and it created a conversation that people didn't want to have in those formats and those platforms. Um, but I think in general, if you can address it and then say, can we have a conversation about this offline? That's usually the best way to approach it, just so it doesn't generate that negativity. But I would look, I, I've worked on a couple of projects in the last couple of years that have been controversial. And it just doesn't do any good to, to keep engaging negative people. Um, I always think about the, um, uh, the, uh, the bell-shaped curve when it comes to audience. You're always going to have those people out front who love you no matter what and will buy your product and they're your early adopters and you really can't offend them. You might say something stupid, but they're going to understand. Then the bell shape, the front end of the bell shape are people who probably will stay with you or you can convince that you're doing pretty well, but those people on the back end and then on the tail end of that curve, um, you're just not going to do yourself any favors by continuing a conversation with them because they're not going to change their attitude. They're not, you're not going to con con convince them to be your customer. And those are the ones you have to be able to look at and say, I can let that go. I need to put all my energy in this group and keep them happy. Hmm. Does that make sense? And I, again, Christina, Monica, Angie, if you have anything to weigh in on that, I think it's, it's a really important question right now. Uh, that's wonderful. We have a question from uh, Mr. Mark Daniels, and he would like to know how important is message consistency in telling your story? It's 100% everything. Um, there are different ways you can tell your story, but you have to, you have to know your values, your beliefs, uh, in your product, your service, and just tell that story over and over and over again. I can't remember, in fact, I need to do, I need to go in and, and look at the research again. It used to be you had to hear a message 11 times before you really understood what it meant. People need to hear your story over and over and over again. Um, and you're gonna be tired of telling your story long before you have, you know, gotten in other people's brains. So, um, find a way to be able to be creative about it. Like it, I go back to the TikTok and uh, the tortilla guys and they told their same story about 12 different ways.
but they were consistent in their brand, in their product, in the fun they were having. So yeah, consistency is everything. Thank you. And then this question comes from Christina. Tammy, your agency is really among the, go the top go-tos in Wichita for major product projects. Everyone would like to craft a brand that's considered a go-to. Can you share what was the tipping point for your firm or what helped to contribute to that momentum? It's a great question, Christina, and thank you. I think you have the same uh, elements. People go to you as well. Um, you know, we've been doing this 17 years. Um, I, the tipping point probably came, well, Vera gave, gave me good advice. She'd been out on her own for a while when we started our business, but um, everything has to be built on trust. And so you have to deliver what you say you're going to deliver over and over and over again. And over time, that builds trust and we've had we've had a couple of incidents in our own careers where things were thrown at us that were kind of negative and um and i can tell you that the 13 or 14 years prior to that of delivering of building relationships of um building trust got us through that rough time um, and now we're we continue to do business with some of those folks who were throwing stuff at us before so um it um, it pays off. It's hard work, especially those early years, um, to get to know the right people and um, work the long hours that people expect you to to, to deliver. Um, but delivering quality and consistently and being willing to say, oh, you know, we need to change, we need to adapt. Those are all part of it. Thank you for that question. Any other questions? Feel free to take your if you have a question, feel free to take yourself off mute and uh and ask or you can use or you can just continue to use the chat. While while we're waiting for anyone else, Tammy, I'd like to, I'd like to know what are some ways that what are some ways that uh that these individuals can go about finding their story. I know you a big part of, you know, figuring out to tell your story is finding that true story. How do you get to the essence of what your story is? You know, um, I should do more. I should do, promote this book I love so much. It's called Start With Why. Um, it's, a, it's an easy read. Simon Sinek, Sinek? Um, I think you're all shaking your head. You know who he is? Oh, my gosh. Um, talk about a, a moment that kind of was a tipping point for me when I read that book. But I think that, that start with why. Why am I in this work? Why am I doing this business model, this plan? Um, we all want to start a story out with how we do it. You know, I get up every day and I write a press release or I do this or that's how I get things done. The why is so much more important. Um, what gets you up in the morning is that drive to succeed, to be positive. Those are the kind of things that make a good story, I think. In fact, Tammy, this is Christina. Could you go back to the slide with Pinole Blue where they have mm -hmm. their description? Because when I read that, that's exactly what it made me think of. Um, they illustrated that perfectly. You just. Yep. Oh, I'm sorry, with the socks. Sorry. Oh, with the socks. Yeah. Yep. My fault. That's no, all right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That statement right there is a great example of starting with why. Mm hmm. Yeah, they're not a sock company. They're they're in the business to build a better world through comfort and um, and yeah. So it's a great example. Right. And those are the things you know. We hear all about the big brands like Apple's not in the technology business. It's in the design business. It it designs things that we never even knew we needed, but now we need them and we like rely on them. So it's it's turning those. Uh, it's like I said, we can get it get really involved. They say that's why Microsoft. It's, didn't take hasn't hasn't sustained itself as well as they always describe themselves as a technology business uh, they really weren't they were computers they really weren't solving problems or or that's the way they've described didn't describe themselves that way so 
We've got a couple of additional questions before we have to end our time with Tammy. One of those questions comes from Donna Wright. What advice would you give to companies that quickly make social justice statements that don't line up with the core values or policies of their company? Donna, that is an excellent question, and it is one that has reared its head uh, several times recently. Um, I think you need to find different ways to, as a business owner, find different ways to engage with that movement. If, if it's not going to reflect your business or if you're going to turn people off, I think you need to find ways to engage with um, those social justice issues separately. Um, don't post things on social media. Rely on other people to post uh, those things. Um, and I, I'll, I'll give you the example of the Kookaburra um, coffee companies, the one I've been following recently, because I just, I, I don't have a, I don't have a dog in the hunt. I don't, I don't know what was right or wrong about that. Um, but she apparently said, some, the owner of that coffee company said some pretty uh, divisive uh, comments on her social media page, and it may have even been the coffee company, so I'd have to go back and look. It's just hard. Um, in the moment, we all want to do something like that. Um, I've gotten, I, I've found myself in that position a couple of times recently where I've called some news media folks out and it uh, luckily hasn't had a uh, long-term effect on my business, but I did, it did follow my advice. I took it offline and had other conversations that I needed to have. So, um, we all get caught up in it. I hope that answers the question. And then uh, lastly from uh, Mark Daniels again, what's, the, what's your advice to overcome how inundated people are with email, social media, and other forms of communication? Oh, that's the million dollar question. Oh, um, you know, I get in a pattern, um, it seems like, although I'm distracted all the time these days, as everybody is. I think if you can kind of schedule your day, um, so you're going to, it's hard to do, but you know you're going to have a couple of hours for social media, a couple of hours for email, uh, new business. I mean, you kind of almost have to schedule yourself anymore and not get distracted by your phone going off and your you know, email coming in turn some of those alerts off um, and, and just at least maybe for a week or two, give it a shot and say, I'm going to schedule my day like this and see if that helps. Nicole, I'm looking at you. Do you have any secrets to your trade in terms of keeping, I know you do a lot of project management. You probably do a lot of that time management stuff. Um, yeah, certainly. So definitely the inundation of emails. I, um, I love grouping everything in conversations. That way when I can stay focused, I'm focused on an entire thread. And we do a lot of project management with a hosted online software called Smartsheet. And honestly, that saved me more times than I can count. So I think um, utilizing tools that help and not hinder your work is really important. I heard you mention that in a previous conversation. That's great, great advice. And, and then, and I'll, I'll come at this a different way from for my for the one last question. I I get the liberty to ask it. That's just the point. <laughs> okay. uh, so, with that being said, with everything you just stated, how if our if your if our customers are doing that, how can we do a better job of connecting to them if they are checking out more and not looking at emails and things of that nature. How can we still connect to them uh, and communicate with them if they are doing those types of things? You know, I don't think it's completely not um, engaging. I think they're just doing, what I would recommend is they're doing it on their own time. So you still need to be out there. You still need to be telling your story. Um, they may not see it uh, until later, um, but I think it even puts even more pressure on that ability to tell your story in a simple, concise, energetic way um, to break through the clutter. Um, but I don't see people really uh, 
shutting off those channels. I go back to building relationships. You're going to find places to have those relationships either online or offline. So. And yeah, media consumption is higher than ever. So even though we think people are disconnected, they're really not. All right. Wonderful. Well, well, Ms. Bradley, thank you again. We appreciate you for taking some time out of your evening to give us all of this wonderful knowledge and these great tidbits uh, about storytelling and how we can do a better job of telling our stories. And uh, the, the thing I walk away with the most is understanding that there really isn't that separation between your business brand and your personal brand and how those decisions have to play a part in all of these things that we do in our communication of what that brand is uh, and connecting that to why. So yeah. I, I definitely thank you for that. Everyone use your reactions, uh, please, uh, to thank our guest, Ms. Brad, Ms. Tammy Bradley. Um, we're gonna let you go so you can get on to your next, minute, your next meeting. Thank, thank you so much. Mr. Long, thank you so much. It was a pleasure being with y'all, thank you. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Well, that was a great, that was a great way to kind of kick off the session with, uh, with that knowledge. And now I'm going to introduce uh, our special guest facilitator for our panel discussion. Uh, uh, Darius Wright is the founder and senior research analyst for Kansas Business Services LLC. And Darius has done a fantastic job of helping connect businesses to resources and helping them strategically plan for growth and success. Uh, so without further ado, Darius, take it away. Mr. Darius Wright. Hey, thank you, Jonathan. Um, it's great to have you all on the call um, this, this evening. And thank you again to, to Ms. Bradley. So um, through the By Design series, um, we've been thinking about how do we get the subject matter experts in key areas of business um, that small businesses need, such as finance, marketing, strategy, putting it all together, um, having them come and facilitate conversations with them um, in a way that everybody can understand and actually be able to apply it. And the guest panel we have today is absolutely no different. We've got some powerhouses in media, marketing, and communications who have local, regional, and, and national reach um, and experience. And um, they are none other than Christina Long of CML Collective and Nicole Cooper of Cop Media. And um, I want them, instead of me delivering a bio about them, I thought it would be good, and Jonathan really drove this home. Since this is a deal about marketing and storytelling, could, could both of you ladies, starting with Nicole, give us 90 seconds. I know Tammy said don't do the spiel or get it out the way, but tell us your story, 90 seconds, the bio of who you are and who your company is, and, and how that qualifies you to have this conversation with us. So, again, thank you both for being here. And, Nicole, um, go ahead. Give us your, your story. All right. Thanks. So I'm not going to be as good of a storyteller as Tammy. Um, but I will do my best. So I'm Nicole Cooper. Um, I work for Cop Media. I've been there for 12 years now. Our agency is coming up on our 30th year. We are a minority women-owned business, which is very exciting. Sorry, guys. Um, so it, it's really honestly a family-run business. We've been anywhere from three to 13 people. So we're a small but nimble organization. We handle paid advertising for a huge range of clients. We handle a ton of nonprofit work, and then we also have global companies that we work with as well. I think the thing that sets us apart is we are available 24 seven. We always say, if there is a day in between, we can make anything happen. So we don't like saying no, because somebody else will say yes, if you say no. And it's also not good for your client um, to not be there and be nimble for them. So. Like I said, we're here in Wichita local. We have one guy that works with us who happens to be my brother. So I do work with two family members, which honestly, it's a lot of fun. So I guess that's my spiel. I think that was under 90 seconds though. Awesome, thank you, Nicole. We're glad to have you. Um, Ms. Christina Long. 
Well, thank you very much for the invitation to participate. Uh, people laugh because I always talk about my nonprofit work as opposed to my for-profit work, but tonight I'm distinctly Christina Long, the principal, and the principal consultant of CMO Collective. We're a graphic design and communication services company. And I started my company in 2013 as a t-shirt company. And before our second anniversary, we expanded to become a graphic design and communication services company. My goal was to be able to bring professional services to communities of color, startups, and nonprofits. And so if you have a message and if there is a platform or service to put it on, we can help you do that. Um, the team is myself. Jonathan is actually our lead strategist. So we bring the family in the work as well. And then we do have a host of contract support, creative talent. We believe that there is so much talent in Wichita. And because of my previous background as a reporter with the Wichita Eagle, I know how to find a good source. So we have the ability to be able to bring the best talent to projects to help our customers to be able to launch and grow. Awesome, thank you, Christina. Um, so we're gonna dive into um, some questions that we've developed for our panel. Um, so if you're here on the call, please um, type um, your questions that you have about media or thoughts you have about the questions we're asking these powerful women um, into the chat and we'll pick them up and we'll be able to ask your questions. Um, we want this to be free flowing and, and get a lot of information out there. So the questions that you have um, where you want more information, please um, um, get those in the chat. Um, I also want to um, ask that Jonathan uh, weigh in also a little bit. Uh, many don't know that Jonathan is a former journalist as well. Um, and so our, understands the the, un, the concept of messaging and communication. So we've got a lot of people here today who have some expertise in this. Um, so Nicole, I, I, I'm gonna kick a question to you first because we've got a money question for you. Um, <laughs> since you talked about uh, paid uh, meat and advertising, with so many ways to spend on a marketing budget, you know, Google ads or Facebook ads and, you know, different media platforms like TV, radio, podcasts, it's so, there's so much going on right now with ways that you can actually spend money. What advice do you offer clients when they're looking to secure paid media? And would you please define what the term paid media is? Yeah, no, that is a great question. So we know that every dollar a client spends is important. A lot of these people we work with, um, you know, they've got a lot of skin in the game. So thousand dollars to them, maybe they're, you know, a shot in the dark. It's their only chance at advertising. So I think it's important to know that a lot of the agencies, because there's quite a few here, they definitely consider that money to be theirs. They find it very personal. So when it comes to deciding paid media, so anything that you can put a dollar behind in order to get eyeballs in front of it, that's what we consider paid media. And it really depends what a client uses. It depends on your goals and objectives. If you have a branding campaign you need to run, you know, branding doesn't work so great just using display, for example, Google display or Google search. You need people to fall in love with your company. So you need a video message in front of people because it's so much easier to tell a story through video. So I think it really depends on the type of company that you're working with. It depends on their budget. And it really depends on their audience. If you only need to target single moms with two kids, you don't need to be on ESPN, right? You need to really tie into your audience, know what kind of media they're consuming and don't bombard them. I think all of us as owners or working in any kind of business, we wanna be there for our customers. We don't wanna annoy them. Nicole, thank you so much for that. I'm, I'm going to uh, pivot off of that question and, and, and put something to Christina. Um, you know, um, you've organically grown your business um, in, in graphic design, marketing, communications, and we've got a number of, of marketing, PR, and other media companies on right now, and then business owners who are trying to figure it out. So hearing from Nicole about how to spend money and, and what she's telling our clients is good, but can you tell us how have you um, in the growth of your company been able to find clients and how do you position yourself as a small business in pricing and making sure that you provide an affordable product without devaluing the service that you're bringing to those potential clients? Yeah, now that's a great question. <laughs> so starting with the idea of organic branding, I believe that 
Again, I'm from Wichita, so I believe that we have a great opportunity to be able to take Wichita's advantage, which is being hyper-connected, to be able to experiment and put together strategies that actually help to push our brands forward based on the um, positive things that we're seeing with our customers engaging in our brands. When you can put together um, a set of actions that lead to sales here locally, then you can begin to expand that into different markets as well. Um, not everybody has a budget at all to be able to uh, hire you know, professional help and graphic designers. So you have to be very intentional about what is the biggest business goal that you're looking for customers to be able to um, address? And then what actions do you need for your customers to be able to take to hit your business goal? Then the marketing and the messaging comes into play. What do you need to say to motivate that behavior so that they can take those actions to support those business goals? And then where do you need to place those messages so that those actions can be motivated to then, again, address your big biggest business goals? In terms of figuring out pricing, that is the big question for all of us. How do we value our times while also making sure that the customers who we wish to be able to serve can definitely afford our services. For us, knowing when we launched our company that we were not initially going after the corporations, we really wanted to, again, help those grassroots and up and coming organizations. But what it ended up happening, what ended up happening was you began to do a volume play where you need to be able to serve a lot of clients to be able to hit your revenue goals. Um, and that was fine for a time in my company. But then as we begin to grow, we had the opportunity to be more selective about the time that we were spending so that we could deliver deep value as opposed to going so wide with so many customers. And that's where we are right now. Awesome. Thank you for that, Christina. I I've got a, a, a question to the entire panel. And so both or, or one answer, and this includes Jonathan. Um, you know, there's this old saying that there's no such thing as bad publicity. That's the old saying. Um, but what are some key characteristics that determine whether marketing Are we back? Okay, I think we back. Okay, I think we back. I think we we're good. Okay, we we good. All right, Darius, okay. go right ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, again, um, I asked, what are some of the key characteristics that determine whether marketing can be considered good or not so good? You can go ahead, Nicole. I'll yeah. follow you. I think. Um, I think certainly leading with good creative, Christina, I think that's so important. I mean, we can have the most targeted placements possible. We can have a database that we're hitting people correctly, the right frequency, the right reach. But um, if your creative is totally off base and doesn't appeal to your consumer, then it doesn't matter where we put it. Um, I also think what makes uh, your messaging, your marketing good is tracking. We are all about data. So if we can track a conversion, foot traffic, website traffic, that's really important to us to know that your targeting and your messaging worked correctly for your customers and that they led to conversions. And I'd echo those same things. In fact, that tracking piece often gets lost when you're in the business of your business. Um, if you are taking time to be able to engage another company or create the creative yourself, then you want to make sure that your efforts and your time are very well spent. So being able to carve into your workflow opportunities to see if your goals for your creative and your marketing is actually being met. That is just as important as putting together those pieces. Amen. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I've got a question that kind of looks at where we're at um, in, in the current um, 
state of, of hyper communications. And, and this came out earlier from Mr. Mark Daniels about, about people being so inundated with all the, the, the different media platforms. Um, but how, how do you help clients really differentiate themselves um, or break through to be heard when there's so much noise and when the customer and consumer are, are so fickle because there's so much information and, and it's hard to keep their attention. There's that bell curve of attention that Tammy talked about earlier. How are you helping clients break through to be heard? So for us over at CMO Collective, it's about authenticity. We don't want to just focus on marketing that creates one single transaction between a client and um, the businesses who we work with. We want to cultivate a community around that brand. So when you cultivate a community, then you're able to break through because you have loyalty. And loyalty is the differentiating factor. So um, building a brand in order to have authenticity, you have to be able to know your brand voice. You have to be able to know your story. It's the things that Tammy was, was speaking about earlier. And I tell you what, when your clients feel completely loyal to your brand, you are not an interruption or a bother. They thirst, they hunger. They want to um, make sure that they are in the know in your community and that they feel value as a member of your community. Yeah, I think having those advocates is so important because hopefully you can build a brand, a campaign where those people are your marketing. Um, I do think that word of mouth is still strong. You know, it, it's hard to foster that. So absolutely, I think creating big supporters rallying around your brand is crucial. But then also, how are you appealing to your culture? How are you appealing your culture to your customers, you know? they're not just gonna go onto your Facebook page and scroll for days to find what's going on. You do have to be in front of them somehow. And again, not, not annoy them. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. And I think, Nicole, you said something really great and that is uh, creating ambassadors. Because again, while we wanna cultivate our community, we also want our communities to be able to grow to reach people and include people who we might not have organically a touch point with. And, or uh, so that when we are activating our paid marketing strategies that they're able to reach and connect because, hey, they're seeing other people who are like them who are following our brands as well. So that's really important as well to be able to continue to grow that community of ambassadors so that it's not just a hyper uh, local niche, but that it can be global if you want. Absolutely. And I forget who asked earlier about social media. You know, do you apply to those negative threads within your feed or do you try to take them offline? Hopefully your ambassadors can actually take those conversations on for you because they are going to be your biggest advocates and you don't even have to get involved. Great point. Sounds like Beyonce's beehive on social media. <laughs> if you say anything about her, her fans will defend her. I um, need a beehive. <laughs> <laughs> we do. We do. So uh, I've, I've got a, another question um, because you all are sharing so many best practices with us. Uh, but um, you're marketing professionals, and I want you to tell us a little bit, what's the real benefit of, of, of partnering with marketing professionals like yourselves um, instead of going alone? And, and how do small businesses know when it's actually the right time to bring in someone to help them because they may have constraints such as budget um, or things like that? Um, even marketing or other media companies, how do they know when it's time to 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 go to a, another um, like business to get support or help. So again, the question is, what's the benefit of working with a marketing professional and, and how, how do I know as a business owner, when's the right time for me to spend some money to increase my brand or take my marketing to the next level? Go ahead, Christina. Okay, so when is the right time? Um, there's a couple of different ways to answer this. And so if you are starting out, then that might not necessarily be budget-wise the best time because, again, maybe you're working um, with a smaller budget to begin with. However, um, marketing-wise, you want to be able to put your resources, toward, your resources towards what can get you, like we heard last night in a workshop, what can get you closest to your clients, closest to a sale. I think that regardless of what space that you are in or what uh, phase you're in in your business development, it's going to be important for you to have a handle on your budget regardless. And marketing has to be a percentage of your um, budget overall, regardless of what phase that is in. So when you know that you need help is when Canva, 
which is a free design <laughs> software is no longer working for you. It's when Google images and, and the rights that you're able to use or deposit photos, these stock art um, places, you're spending more time trying to figure out your creative and less time uh, doing what you need to do to be able to move your business forward. When it becomes so big that you can no longer manage it and you can no longer piece it together, you can't barter for it, things of that nature, and you may want to go ahead and begin looking at who could be a good fit. And you have options. There are freelancers, there are other graphic design artists who are trying to build a portfolio. There are agencies as well, and many of them specialize in many different things. You can look at, you know, their pay plans and things of that nature um, and really figure out what creative talent is going to be the best fit based on your percentage of your budget that you have dedicated for marketing at that particular phase in your business and with your business goals in mind. Perfect. And honestly, I, I echo that 100%. I think it's going to depend on the time you have because as starting up a business, guess what? You don't have a lot of times. You are working those evenings. You're working the weekends just like a lot of us do. So I think it depends. Are you able to shift something off of your plate so you can focus on growing your business? Um, when you talk about rate structure, we're pretty straightforward. It's a flat 15%. So is 15% of your marketing budget, is that worth it to take the stress off to know that somebody else is going to take on the credit that, you know, we're going to take all the rep phone calls? I can't even tell you how much time clients would waste talking to rep after rep after, I mean, the digital agency emails, I get them all. So I think, is it worth, is it worth your time? Um, and you said, you know, when do you need to take that off your plate? I love Mitch Joel. If you guys don't know Mitch Joel, check him out. He's written some great books, but the way that he puts it, he says, um, just because you can turn on a light doesn't make you an electrician. So just because you can boost a Facebook post does not make you a digital marketer. So I think leaving it to a professional will not only improve your campaign, but maybe you can get a little more sleep and grow your business. Wow, that, that's that's great. Well, Nicole, let me let me follow up with uh, with a budget question. This came from um, Mark Daniels uh, in terms of what rates you all are charging. Do you ever use media bundling to make it afford more affordable for small businesses, or are there places where you're able to to discount services or offer something different uh, than what your standard rate may be? Um, that's a very good question. So we don't uh, we don't bundle media. So for me, every client is different. I want your media mix to be unique, just like your business is unique. So I don't want to go buy up a bunch of inventory that we hold as an agency and then decide, well, you know, I've got to put it somewhere. So client A has to get a little bit. So does client B and client C because it's sitting there. So we don't do bundling, but we do allow our clients to take part in negotiated rates for from larger budget clients. So like television, radio, and outdoor smaller clients benefit from our mass negotiations because we do carry a fairly big stick here in the market and we can decide to place or not place. So a lot of clients, no matter the size, do benefit from that. But for the most part, if you spend a million dollars, it's a 15% fee. If you spend a thousand dollars, it's a 15% fee. We don't, we don't pick and choose. Um, I will say out of, we handle quite a few nonprofits we do um, cut quite a bit of that back to our nonprofits. So that would be an exception. Awesome, thank you so much. We've got, uh, the, the chat is blowing up with questions, so I'm, I'm gonna get to some of these here. Um, we've got a question from, from Justin Wright. Um, he said, I have assumed the position as a marketing director for a photography company. What is the correct budget to rebrand a company, five to 8% or more? Yeah, so it's it's hard to say off of the cuff just a straight percentage because as Nicole has shared as well, um, every company is different. And so I would actually um, encourage you to have conversations if, if you can with the company about what what are their goals in terms of the increase in their sales? 
what what is the action that will let them they're talking about rebranding so what does that actually mean what are they trying to accomplish and then based on the goals that they are trying to accomplish create a series of strategies that then can help to address those goals and then based on the time spent that it's going to take to be able to execute those strategies and including um, any kind of paid advertising that will go in support of those strategies that's how you begin to build that budget not just a straight percent it's got to be able to be a little bit more nuanced than just flat off the top five percent in my opinion no i totally agree because all of that cost is going to be up front mm -hmm. absolutely we've got another question from mark daniels um again we're kind of in this whole money and marketing um strain right here he says what would you say is an industry standard roi or rate of return that you should look for in marketing or advertising dollars spent so mark is wanting to know you know if i spend the money how much revenue should i expect ratio wise that i should get back based on the the marketing that i'm doing i think that depends on um the competitive marketplace it depends on the cost of your product the how long does it take for someone to make that decision i mean if you have an 18 month long buying cycle you're not going to see any traditional roi for a year and a half. So I think it depends on the product you're marketing. What are you marketing? Can you tell us that in the chat? Mark, Mark um, is, I don't want to speak for him. Um, he has in the food service business, but cheesecakes um, is, is the primary product that, that Mark sells. Now he might say that he's making tummies feel good or something. So that it's not just limited to cheesecakes, but um, that is his primary product and they are good. And I'm not a sweets person. All right, so that's a very tangible product. Um, you're gonna inspire someone to probably purchase that, you know, late at night. And, and um, it's not it's not super expensive. So I mean, three to one, five to one, maybe. I don't I don't know. I, th I think it I think it depends. I don't know if Christina has an opinion. It's hard to know. Nicole, you're saying for every three dollars spent, expect one dollar return in revenue, or what's that ratio? Uh, vice versa. Vice versa. Okay, so for every dollar spent, three dollars back in revenue. Something you might be able to spec for that type I, of. I think that'd be fairly conservative. Okay, for that particular type of product, given the marketplace and what he is particularly selling, which is different if he was selling paper, maybe or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just because we work with um, we work with a quick service restaurant, so that's typically what they would expect. Not quite the same, but. Mm -hmm. Similar. And a lot of these um, industry related questions, um, some of these answers can be found by actually looking at industry reports. So uh, Wichita State University's libraries, they actually have marketing databases that will give you access to uh, industry by your NACE code. And again, your NACE code is your North American industry class, uh, classification code. And that is what distinguishes one type of business from another. But in that, you can kind of see what's happening within that industry. You can look at the industry standards in terms of performance. You can put, look at volatility, insights. Um, and they actually, some of the databases do a better job than others of actually breaking it down in common language for you to be able to understand and plan from. Very smart. Awesome, thank you for that. Um, again, um, continue if you all have questions. We have some more generalized questions that we wanna ask the panel. Um, we've got a question from Donna Wright. She says, what is the value of having a website, domain name, business email address, et cetera? Um, some more specificity, uh, not just my personal name or something. What are the perceptions of small businesses that may not have these things when trying to market to their customers? Am I not professional because I, I don't have, I don't own my own URL and have the email server with my company business name behind it? Um, what are your thoughts about that? Consistency is key. There's so many um, low cost to free resources and Google, for example, all of the tools available with Google My Business are free to use and that includes a free website. Um, domain names. If you're going to purchase one, GoDaddy, for example, you can purchase one um, for a year for $9.99. A personalized uh, mailbox for to $6 on uh, Google G Suite. So being able to um, budget 
a professional rollout does include having a professional presence across those domain names, your websites, even MailChimp, which is the eBlast company, they're now giving landing pages that are connected with URLs. So again, um, part of having a, a reputable uh, business is to be able to showcase a reputable front across multiple fronts. And there's too many tools now that are available. Uh, you will not be outpriced trying to get a, a website. Not anymore. I agree. I think you, you have to have that. Not having those things would be like not having a phone number for your business. Which, by the way, Google Voice allows you to set up a free phone number for your business if you do not wish to use your own personal phone number. That that is that is great. So um, if if I could could ask you, you this question, and I know that this is not going to be easy to answer, or that there may be one particular answer, but um, you know, media in terms of of technology is is rapidly progressing so fast um, that the platforms um, are are completely changing. You know, um, I love radio, terrestrial radio. Um, and they say terrestrial radio is dying, but then now the radio is going to what's called podcasts, so it's just over the internet. I mean, so it's still radio, but I guess because it's not using the same frequencies, I guess, makes it different. Um, or we're looking at web 2.0, 3.0. Um, just your opinion as professionals, where do we need to be concentrating our marketing efforts? You know, um, I hate to say it, but if newspapers are dying, um, do I advertise in newspapers or other periodicals or print media? Where do we need to be looking at in the future to where we spend our money and where we market and advertise to our customers? And I, I know there's no one size fits all answer, but your, your opinion and best practice. Go ahead, Nicole. Um, I mean, I've always been a believer in media mix. So certainly audiences are fragmented, but consumption is up. So I know everybody says, nobody's tuning in to over the air TV. Well, actually they are. They're tuning in to the same amount of hours of over the air TV. But now they're also streaming, you know, they're on Hulu, they're on Netflix, they're on Roku. So people are consuming more media above and beyond what they were. Um, so I'm probably a really good example. I'm probably not going to see anything on over the air television, but you know, I drive every day. I'm on Snapchat occasionally, you know, I'm on Facebook. You can reach me there, but you're probably not going to reach me on the 10 P news. But if your audience is there, Let's say you want to target grandparents, guess where they're consuming their media, also Facebook, and they are consuming the newspapers. So I think it depends on your target audience, but you do have to have a media mix. To run a campaign, just, we're, just sugarcoat it for everybody, less than four strategies would be insane. So, you know, maybe you need to be on Pinterest, YouTube, outdoor and radio something like that. So having that mix, you can at least hit your target audience where they're consuming is really important. I absolutely agree. The key is the media mix. And um, based on, again, who you're trying to reach, you have to understand uh, your customer profile to be able to know which media that they are expecting to um, receive messaging from, where it's not, again, seen as interruption. So case in point, I'm just going to give one anecdote, and that is there was a new business that was um, popping up in College Hill. And so that particular company was fretting about how do I get the word out? How do I get the word out? And so, yes, we recommended, you know, social media, uh, advertising and some other things, but we also really pushed hard for them to do, based on the type of business that they were, to do a, a direct mail piece with postcards. And we were able to um, get them connected in a very easy manner with a mail list that looked at the households because that particular uh, business was looking to reach households geographically located close to their uh, office. And so what ended up happening was um, that the postcard distribution was fantastic. It worked. They came back and was like, we had no idea postcards would still work in today's age. Again, if you have um, something of interest based on your customer profile and your ge geography is a strategy, you want to be able to get people in close proximity to your location, don't even discount if it makes sense, the postcards and your media mix. Um, you know, again, print production and things of that nature, it, it seems to be outdated, but again, it's all based on your goals of how you reach and who you reach. Absolutely. Some people still pick up 
the yellow pages and guess what it still makes sense for one generation you know so absolutely don't I love the one generation <laughs> my mom still loves her yellow pages <laughs> i used to deliver those swabibs um big books around the city uh, to make money and uh yeah i mean people are still still utilizing them um so uh, just in terms of um, some more best practices, uh, what are some of the best practices pertaining to making the most of digital marketing platforms, such as online media and social media? How, how do you make the most of it, though? Okay, so yeah, I know I should use it, and maybe I'm some stuff, but how do I make the most of it, um, you know, making sure that I'm not too frequent, I'm not oversaturating, those kind of things? I think um, certainly targeting is how you make the most of it. So really know your audience, kind of like what I touched on earlier. I love to be in areas right now that you have a larger share of voice. So something like an OTT, which is over the top uh, video or streaming, people aren't looking at any other ads. If my target audience is watching The Bachelorette and she is for sure gonna stay there watching my 30, 15 second video, so she can keep consuming her, her content. So I think that's really important is to not get lost in the mix and to be in front of the right people. Absolutely. And again, regardless of what percentage of your budget that you are um, dedicating to marketing, go back to the basics and hit those strong. Good pictures, good video, good sound, not shaky. Um, those kinds of things, regardless of how much or how little money you have in your marketing, makes all of the difference differentiating, again, the professionalism and the perception of your brand. Um, and that's just bar none. Spend some time. If you don't, if you can't afford a camera or if you don't want to invest in a camera at this stage in your company, many of us have camera phones. Figure out how to get great camera phone pictures that work for social, but understand what you capture on your camera phone does not work for a billboard. So be mindful, too, of the platforms that you're using, the equipment that you have or the time that you have it based on your business development pace. I know that WSU, their School of Digital Arts, um, you can actually hire their students. Their program is all designed around applied studies. So they want their students out there in the community working on projects for their portfolios. You can actually post on their job boards that you need you know, professional photo taken of your cheesecake, for example. So you can post those things out there and get freelance type work from local students. That's fantastic. And also Shocker Studios as well. They do the same thing related to video services too. If you yeah. allow them to produce uh, videos, then that pricing is very, very nice for companies. Yeah, and WSU provides all those nice cameras for them. Yep. yep. <laughs> Well, everybody here that WSU has got a lot of resources for you if, if you're looking to do something. We've got one final question we're going to pose to our panel and then uh, ask you all for some final thoughts before we shut down this evening. Thank you all so much for your time and everybody being here, um, sticking around through, through this session. Um, this question comes from Mark Daniels. He says, larger companies forecast six to 12 months in advance. Uh, what's a strategy or resource to connect your brand or company to current trends? Nicole, you can take that one. Yeah, um, so we've even, we're not currently, but we have worked with brands even like Texture Navigation. So they forecast 10, 20 years in advance. So in order to connect with that, I think you have to have a long-term and a short-term outlet. So what are your short-term goals? Um, depending on your company's forecast, if it's a turbulent market, usually the first thing to get cut is marketing, which not just because I'm in marketing, but I don't think that's the right decision. Um, so I think you have to prepare if it's going to be a turbulent year and how you're going to ride those waves. Connecting with current trends, that's, that's tough. Um, we have a client that says we always want to be uh, on trend but never trendy. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a good outlook to know, yeah, that's what the trend, that's what the marketplace is saying, but what's your company saying? You know, maybe you're able to deliver a product that someone within your same field can't. So pay attention to trends if they make sense for you. Otherwise, just stay your course and be consistent. And I would agree. Speak to where your customers are, not where the trends are. 
Well, lady, um, thank you so much for, for all your insights. I, I would ask that uh, bef um, before Jonathan takes it back over and we close, um, give us one last thing that we absolutely have to know. You said so much, but if there's one thing you left out or one thing that you've got to hit home for, for us uh, small business owners, uh, marketing or branding or PR enthusiasts, what is it that we need to know? And then once you're done with that, uh, Jonathan, take back over. So thank you again for your time. Sure. Thanks for having us. I'll go. Um, for me, plan based on your business goals and then act in ways that um, that uplift and affirm your business voice. Schedule time in your workflow to handle your marketing and don't try to do it all, but be consistent in what you've agreed to do. Thank you for having me. That's great. I think um, for us, certainly stay the course. You know, it's all about little adjustments along the way. It's not about starting and stopping, but actually trusting the process. And I think if you need someone, there's a lot of great local resources and fantastic agencies. So use someone if you do need someone that has a good reputation and that you can get along with because your agency, your creative agencies, they really are an extension of your brand and you want them to be representing you correctly. Thank you guys. Wow, wow, this is fantastic information. Thank you, uh, Christina. Thank you, Nicole, for all of your uh, great information for the day. Darius, thank you for facilitating a wonderful conversation. Um, and again, we we appreciate all of you who, who joined us tonight. Uh, it was an outstanding uh, event with lots of really good information. Look forward, we'll be reaching out to you all uh, to let you know uh, how you can get access to this video so you can rewatch it. There's so many jewels. I, I mean, my pen probably over here out of ink almost uh, from trying to write down some of this stuff. And I've got level A level access to most of it too. So it's still being able to write, it, write down this information. So again, thank everybody for participating uh, with us tonight. I want to take the time out to thank uh, Ms. Monica Poe and Angie Prather from the Chamber for hosting, for hosting this event for us tonight. Thank you all um, for your time tonight as well. And without, with nothing else and all minds clear, you guys have a good night and have a wonderful rest of the week.